blessed. <coughs> I love uh, when we read our daily readings. I hope that we all are. It's amazing to me just how God speaks to us um, in the areas of life that we find ourselves in, in, in some of the simple verses like Brother Dabney shared that he's read multiple times, but yet that one moment in time, it kind of spoke to him. And God has a strange way of doing that in our lives, of coming in and... Um, changing how we look at things sometimes, and uh, it's amazing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this privilege and opportunity that we have to come together this morning. We thank you for your great love that you have shown to each and every one of us today. And, and God, we pray that you would help us today to hear your message, that we would apply it to our lives, that we would use it for your glory. I pray that you would help us each to be sensitive to your spirit today. Lord, help me to share what you'd have me to share this morning, Father. We love you, we thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Father's Day, by the way, to those to whom it applies. Um, today I want to talk about ears to hear. And uh, as I was um, throughout the weeks, you know, you get these little thoughts, and so I, was, I mark these things down, and then the Lord kind of develops and speaks to my heart about some of these things, and... and um, Things, messages, thoughts begin to grow on these things. And it's interesting that we have mentioned in the past um, how strange it is of how little we remember things spoken to us. There are surveys and studies that have been done. You can Google any one of those things and you can find out. You can, and I, then you find the ones that say, well, that's not true. But in reality, we kind of know. But there was a chart that was developed years ago and it talked about how much we developed in or how much we heard, but then it talked about simple listening, and then at the bottom of the chart, the base of the pyramid, if you will, it was a pyramid, at the base of it said, um, our interaction really helps us to remember. When we do something, we remember a whole lot more than when we just simply hear something, and you can probably identify with that, because throughout your life, you know, you have done different things, and we can ask you, do you remember uh, last year, just before Thanksgiving, what the message was? Well, of course not. Probably not. But if we ask you, how was the Thanksgiving or the uh, July 4th picnic, you could probably reflect on that because you actively participated in that. You probably brought something for a side dish or whatever the case may have been. But it's because we interact with these kind of things. But how much more when we're involved with these things? I remember times when I was in school or in training sometimes in my career and um, wasn't really engaged. And as a matter of fact, probably doing something else, daydreaming or something else like that, but creating the appearance that I was interested in these things until the instructor called on me or the teacher called on me to answer a question in reference to what they were teaching. Well, then you get the deer in the headlights look, right? Just like, because <laughs> you weren't paying attention. Or when your spouse says, you didn't hear a word I said. Yep, I did. Okay, what did I just say? <laughs> Same thing, right? We've all probably been there from time to time. Darla knows. <laughs> but what I'm sharing about today is, is uh, our, that's what we're doing here today is we're listening. You know, we're hearing this, this word of God. And, I'll, and, and, <laughs> and so I thought to myself as I was writing all this, typing it in, I said, well, all right, so that's what we're going to be doing today, all right? So arbitrarily throughout the service, I'll just call on you to answer a question in reference to, you know, <laughs> yeah, that probably won't happen, right? And so, but what I'm sharing today is about hearing and not necessarily hearing the things of man, but to God. And uh, I thought that that was just amazing. And Proverbs 13, 1, it says, A uh, wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scoffer heareth not rebuke. This is uh, just that alone. I mean, if you were just, just take, take the first part of that verse, and it says, A wise son hears his father's instructions. If you thought on that, what would you think? If you thought on... If you, if you look at the Father in reference to who God is, and we think, do we hear our Heavenly Father's instructions? It's really kind of powerful when you think about it, the opportunity and the privilege that we have to hear the Creator of all things when He speaks to our heart. 
Solomon was probably not David's favorite son, but yet he did listen to David. He heard the instruction that his father David gave him in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 3, and it says, David told Solomon, and keep the charge of Jehovah thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his ordinances and his testimonies according to that which is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest and whether thou turnest thyself. So many kings in Israel who had godly fathers, and it's always been amazing to me, had godly fathers or those who pursued a relationship with God and sought God in terms of should they go out to battle, should they do these things, and so on and so forth. And yet those individuals who observed what their dads had been doing went the other way. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, case in point. A wicked king didn't listen to him at all. But today, I wanna, I was, as I was thinking about this ears to hear, one of the more common passages of Scripture that talk about that particular phrase is in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. And we might, we'll be hitting just a, a verse out of each of those things. But look at what, if you're in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, it says, To the angel of the church as Ephesus, write, or these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his hand and walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. That is an interesting verse when you think about it, because here it is... Christ, who is going to be sharing these things about these churches, but this God of creation holds the churches in his hands. You know, and it's really kind of interesting because sometimes we don't necessarily imagine God having oversight and so on and so forth in this particular church, and he walks amongst them observing, judging, loving churches, and he still does, I believe, today. But of these seven, he condemns them for various sins forsaking him, claiming to be Jews but are not, and also practicing false religions, lukewarm or other things. In Ephesus, he says, you're forsaken your first love. And with these things, these condemnations that he brings upon those seven churches, there is also a verse or two or three about a victory for those who overcome. And that is so important because it shows us the depth of the love and the mercy of God that in spite of what we do in life, because we all fail, probably more than we want to admit, but he is always willing to take us back and to, to show us that there is victory in store for each and every one of us. And that, to me, is pretty amazing. But to the church at Ephesus, verse 7, it says, Whoso has ears to hear, let him hear. And so I thought to myself, all right, I like looking at uh, Strong's Concordance. They have a, a numbering system. I have a Bible program on my tablet here and also at home called e-sword.net. You can download it for free. You can, you know, put a million different Bibles in there, versions if you want. You can buy some additional features. But they have that Strong's Concordance in there where there's a number associated with each of these key words. And so I clicked on that section. It comes with the basic version of that software. It's free, so just in case you're wondering. And I don't get any royalties from it. But anyway, it's a good program. And so I thought, well, all right, let me look at it because I thought I'd be really cool, right? So let me, let me click on that verse and see if there is any kind of reference to the word heareth. And coincidentally, there's not. So apparently here just means here. <laughs> but it says... Whosoever has let him, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, keeping in mind that this church left their first love. Yet he says that you'll dine with me. You will eat from the tree of life if you are victorious and overcome this obstacle that has been thrown before you. Sometimes it was a result of leadership, poor leadership. And you see that in the nation of Israel as you go. When the king was a godly king, things were changing for the nation as a whole. In Smyrna, it says, those who claim to be Jews but are not. But in verse 11, it says, he who has a hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Amazing that God would, would throw that out there to those who wanted to overcome. In Pergamum, it says, there are some among you who hold fast to false teachings. Repent. In verse 17, he says, whoso has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious, 
I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone and a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Theatira, paganism, rituals were brought into the, the, play, the uh, church, such as the worship of Mary and child, mass that was said on behalf of the dead, purgatory, things such as that. In verse 20 it says, But I have somewhat against thee that thou sufferest the woman Jezebel to call, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teacheth and seduceth my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Seduce means to fundamentally depart from the truth. That's kind of interesting. It says that, we fundal that that church was fundamentally departing from the truth. The world does that to us today, doesn't it? It tells us the same lie that Satan used in the garden. You won't die, but in reality we will. And not necessarily that, that physical death, but that spiritual death. And it is so subtle that we don't even realize it when it's happening in our life because we didn't see a consequence for that action. And we, and we believe it because of that, for that very reason, which in some cases makes it worse. But he goes on today to say, and he says, To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. The one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And Sardis, he says, they are dead. How bad is that? You are spiritually dead. But he says to the one who is victorious, will I liken, I will dress, and dressed in white, I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. That's kind of an interesting verse, verse five, or by verse five of chapter three, because as I read that, you know, obviously other things pop into at least my mind. It says, the one who is victorious will like them be dressed in white, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. So apparently, this is Jesus speaking, your name can be blotted out of the book of life. Jesus wouldn't have said that if it wasn't true. We need to be careful of how we walk with God and to walk with him honestly, purely, humbly, just as his word declares. The, uh, Philadelphia, they had false religions in the church, false teachings coming in and, and uh, were practicing those things. But he says to the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the new name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. And finally, Laodicea, the lukewarm church. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down on my, with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And it's kind of interesting, just that expression, because to me, we have a privilege now to be able to hear the Word of God. And apparently, obviously, we have a choice that we can make to hear what he says, to believe it, to apply it to our lives, to make a change in our lives, to allow the Spirit of God to lead us, to guide us, and to do all the things he's promised, but it's our choice. Jesus used the expression ears to hear concerning John the Baptist, you aren't, we don't have to turn there, about Elijah being having already come. He also used it in Matthew 13 with the parable of the sower. He used it in Matthew 13 talking about weeds growing in with good seed. He talked about it with a lamp under a bushel. He talked about it about what defiles a person. He also talked about salt without flavor. Talking about, and he says to, in each of those circum circumstances, he who has ears to hear. So, each of those that Jesus was talking about, understanding the parable or the analogy pertaining to that particular kingdom principle, and those given so that we would understand how important it was to grasp the truth of what Jesus was saying in each and every one of those instances. So that we would hear with the point of understanding and applying it to our lives to make a change so that we could be what God had intended us to be. John the Baptist obviously was, was prophesied that Elijah would return and prepare the way for the Lord. Well, 
John the Baptist was that man. There are four kinds of soils, the sower and the seed, right? Three of which do not permit growth, certain spiritual growth, but only the one, the good ground. Not everyone who says they're a Christian is a Christian. They can say what they want, but the proof is in the fruits, isn't it? And when we talk about judging, you know, we have to look at that verse about judging because he's talking judging in one thing, not judging people as a whole, because we can tell. People use that excuse oftentimes. Well, you're just judging me. No, I'm just telling you what the obvious is. And we see those things. We know what kind of fruit falls from trees. What comes out of you defiles you. When he's talking about hear, hearing and listening, if you act and talk like the world, you're of the world and you need to turn to God. We are to show the world that God, what God can do in a life, work as, as the light of the world or under a bushel. Season the world with the glory of God working in you. And it's amazing. Um, you may have throughout your life heard in your relationship with God, people say things about you pertaining to what God is doing in our lives. Each of these end-time churches were given an admonition to turn from sin, and those who do were victorious. The interesting thing about it is that everybody has ears and hears, but not everyone can hear the Word of God. They can hear an audible sound, but, not, but miss the message. When you think about that, you th I thought about Paul and his friends in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. Paul only heard and understood the voice that was speaking, whereas those who were with him only heard a sound. It's the same thing with sometimes when we attend church, we can hear the message, but not really hear it to comprehend it, to apply it to our lives. The Lord uses this phrase to alert dull ears so that we can pay attention to a key kingdom principle that is very important in our lives. He says that if we have ears to hear, but they hear not, some people. Now he speaks to those who understand spiritual things. If a person wants to know God, they can. And that is so important to understand. If a person wants to know the Word of God and have a relationship with God, they can. When I was in the Navy, and I was, and I shared this before, and I was with my friend, we were in Japan on a ship, and obviously God was doing a work in my life, unbeknownst to me, by questioning the reality of God. Now, as I mentioned, I grew up in the Catholic Church, which didn't amount to very much. But as I was there on my ship, and I was laying there, you get a little bit of time on your hands underway. Jim wouldn't know because he never was underway. But uh, as you're there, you know, I was thinking about God. And obviously he planted something in my heart to, as to the reality of God. Is there a God? Is he real? Well, that thought had always been there. And then when I transferred from Japan, I came over here in uh, a ship in San Diego. And then when I, that ship went up to Bremerton, thought still on my heart, and God's still working on my heart. I'd heard various things um, in the meantime, but when I was in Bremerton and I was just walking the streets because I had nothing else to do in a big city, no place to go, and you know, you want to get off the ship when you're off, on du off duty. So I'm walking around this, the, the streets there, and it was a rural neighborhood, and just as clear as me talking to you, I believe that God spoke to my heart and said, go buy a Bible. That's all he said. It's kind of interesting how succinct God can be when he speaks to you, right? There's no fluff. There's no beating around the bush. It's just do this and, uh, or instruction or guidance or whatever the case may be. And so I did. The, the bottom line is if you want to know who God is, he'll reveal himself to you. You can find him. If a person wants to know the truth, they can. But if you shut your ears to it, you have that prerogative. You can do that. There are multitudes of so-called broad-minded people today who shut their ears to the Word of God. If you don't want to hear it, you don't. Not only will you fail to hear it, but you won't understand even if you did hear it because you're not even prepared. You don't care to hear what it is. It's more show than anything else. You must have the kind of ear that God wants so that you can understand. God says that to each of us, doesn't he? We have the opportunity and the privilege to hear the Word of God and to act on it. And if we turn from sin and we persevere in our relationship with him, we will know him. We will hear him. And he asks us to guard our heart. In there, there is victory. In the presence, 
in, in the present time, and also as we continue to walk through with Christ in the future, there is victory for us. And so as I was thinking about, you know, when Christ was talking about the victory to these seven churches, and I was thinking, okay, what is victory to you? What is victory to many of us? Is it living a comfortable life? I mean, there is a, there is a, a battle won there. How about a good tax return? That's always fun. Winning the lottery? Don't know. Won't get a chance to unless I find a winning lottery ticket laying on the street. Knowing your kids are doing well, whatever that means. There's always versions of that. No current problems in our lives. A job, a home, needs met. So maybe you've come up with one as you're even listening to what is a personal victory to you. And there's many of these definitions of victories. There's many things that happen in our lives that we can be victorious in. And I would submit to you that any of these things or things with earthly paybacks pale in comparison to the victory we have in Christ, don't they? They just don't compare at all. The victory, this, this victory that God offers to us brings joy in the midst of a situation. Not all the others do. There is no lasting joy in things in the world or in persons apart from Christ. And I'm not saying that personal victories aren't important or they don't mean anything because there are milestones in our lives that are good accomplishments. I mean, there's great accomplishments that we do, but it's not like the victory that Christ gives us. It doesn't give us the same level of satisfaction. It doesn't mean as much to us. There are small battles that we face on a daily basis, but it's not winning the whole war, whereas submitting to Christ, surrendering our lives to him, the battle's won. He's accomplished that at Calvary. The Christian's victory is nothing that we can do in themselves, but what Christ has done for us. And whatever happens to you, good or bad, good or bad, we are still victorious in Christ. He is still on the throne. So let me ask you a question. When you're struggling in a situation in life and you're really down and, and it's a really tough battle, do you say, where's my car? I fought so long for that thing and, and it, was a, it brought so much joy in my life. Where's that car? Where's that deposit slip from that tax return that I got that was so encouraging that day? No, our retreat is to the Lord, isn't it? He's the one that we look to in those tough battles. There is where we find victory in the midst of the battle. There is where we find joy and security from the storm. The message to the churches was, was given in love. And sometimes that's hard to see, but the bottom line is it was. God does that for each and every one of us. He comes and he talks to us, and the Holy Spirit convicts us where we are so that we can be conformed into the image of Christ. Out of love, he does that so that we can be more Christ-like, so that we will have rewards here on earth, so that when we see him someday, he will say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. There are many who hear the words as the Bible says, but the word did not take fruit it, or root, it fell on bad ground. The Bible was given in love as well, wasn't it? When we look at the message of the Bible, we hear that God is asking us to confess our sin since we are all born with it. Accept the message of Christ, substitutionary death on the cross, surrender our lives to him, and things change. Things happen in our lives and you know those things. You've experienced, probably most or many of you, basically a heart not willing to surrender, one who will not recognize Christ as Savior, one who does not count the sacrifice of the things of the world worth Christ, one who doesn't trust Christ and burden with the cares of this world, basically pearls before swine. Christ talked about that. How many of here today... Check your Facebook post while you're sitting in church. Or a text message. Or browse your email. Or God forbid, Candy Crush. <laughs> if you could hear the emotion of what God says to Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7.14, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now that was talking to... Um, Solomon in a particular portion of time, but apparently they were not humble towards God. There was arrogance, there was pride. This was what God was speaking to Israel on that day, but that formula applies to each and every one of us today, isn't it? 
God asks us to humble ourselves, to come before him. <clears throat> we are his people called Christians today. If we would humble ourselves, turn to God, and from the things of the world, its pleasures and the draw of the world, and I'm not saying that we can't have fun because we live in this world and there's all kinds of emotions that we run into, but none of those things are as important as our relationship with God. And if the things of the world are taking more of your time than, than a relationship with God, then you have a problem. We need to be forgiven. We need to allow God to speak to our hearts and change us. It's not just a wonderful worship service that sustains us. Many of these big churches, they have a lot of worship services. I don't know about the content of the messages, but I do hear, you know, I see the Facebook things of worship services and those individuals who lead those things and so on and so forth. And worship is a big thing. Don't get me wrong, it's important. But the worship service isn't all the church service is. And some people miss that and focus and make it a priority. We need that vibrant relationship with God to sustain us 24 hours a day. A song may be important for a time. It may lead us into the presence of God. We may have felt the presence of God during a worship service, but it's that relationship with God that sustains us. And that's so important. We can't, we, one that is not distracted by the cares and draws of the world. Each one of us journey through life, as we all know. Some longer than others, some more difficult than others. There are various trials and joys along the way. All are unique. And it's easy sometimes to look at other individuals and say, why? How come? And Peter was speaking to Jesus in John 21, verse 21. Jesus seeing him say to Jesus, Lord, and what shall that man do? Jesus said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what's that to you? We have to be careful that when we walk our daily walk, it's easy to become envious and jealous of other individuals and to see what's going on in their lives and want that, but that may not be what God's journey is for you. Had Darla not gone through the cancer experience that she did, she may not be doing the things that she's doing today and touching the people she's touching today. But in the midst of it, she wasn't happy about it. When, it was first, when she was first diagnosed, she wasn't happy about it as many of you were as well when you heard of or experienced things in life. You weren't happy about it, but that journey allowed you to insight, give you, give you insight on things in life, and it changed your perspective on things. So we can't be distracted by those individuals. Who are the, who are the victorious among us? Those who have heard, those who have obeyed, and are practicing the presence of God in their lives every day, putting him first, following his leading. So the question is, what have you heard concerning Christ that he loves you above all others, that he died on a cross for you and that he asks you to follow him? Do you hear that message and respond to it? Because that's really what it boils down to in the end. What have you done for my son? Or what will you say when you stand before God? You see, the reality is that what Christ was telling us in Revelation 2 and 3 and to those churches who do not act on the warning given will perish. God even says that to each and every one of us. This message was given. He died on a cross so that we can be saved from the sin that we were born into. It is motivated by love. It is prompted by love. As with us, if we do not act on the guidance that Christ has given us, the things that we have heard, the warnings that Christ has given us concerning eternal damnation, we will receive the just rewards of that. You can't talk about the love of God without talking about what he saved you from. Each and every one of us have been or have the opportunity to be set free by the power of Christ so that we don't have to look to the, uh, the damnation that is promised to those who choose not to accept him or choose to play the game. The whole message of the Bible is God's love for us and wanting a relationship with each and every one of us individually. The message simultaneously with the warnings of um, not turning to God has its consequences. In 2 Peter 2.4, it says, If God spared not the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and committed them to pits of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. What it boils down to is ears to hear. 
Will we allow the Spirit of God to conform us into the image of Christ? Jesus talking to the is the disciples in Mark chapter 13, speaking of the religious leaders and the community, if you will. He says, For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, for their eyes they have closed, lest happily they should perceive with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should turn again, and I should heal them. Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. And that's what God is asking us today. So that... Do we hear what the word of God is or do we say, well, I'm okay? Or do we look in look in terms of God's word and we ask ourselves, how am I doing in relation to my to the word of God? Am I doing what God asks me to do or am I allowing things of the world to permeate my life and cohabit with that sin? It's easy to do when there's no, evident, no apparent consequence for those things. But the churches in Revelation didn't think so either until Christ called attention to them. We want a vibrant relationship with Christ, each and every one of us, I know. I'm no different than you. We all want to be used by God in some capacity. And when we look at others who are, you have to ask yourself why. If you see those individuals who are exhibiting those gifts of the Spirit, there is, there is a reason for that. There is a price that has been paid, not just because of what Christ did on the cross, but sacrifice of the world's pleasures and goods so that they can focus and they can draw closer to God, and he uses them as a result. That's what we all want. We want to hear what the Word of God says, hear what the point of understanding and applying to our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we have to come together today. Lord, we thank you for your word that you tell us, Lord, about having ears to hear. We know we do, Father, but are we hearing what you are talking to us today about? What you have been talking maybe to some of us, and we have just kind of been putting it off for one reason or another. Help us, Lord, to acknowledge that, to thank you. For you're making us aware of things in our lives, Lord, because it's out of love that you do these things, Lord, so that we might be drawn closer to you. So thank you, Lord, for putting your finger maybe on a situation in our life that needs resolution, that needs work. God, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to draw close to you and to surrender these areas of our life, Lord, whatever they may be. You are a wonderful Heavenly Father. You care for each and every one of us. Lord, and I thank you for that mercy and love truly that you show us every day. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us, Father, to draw close to you and to be the children that you called us to be. We love you, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. We'd like to uh, would you stand with me and we'll be dismissed.